taken from the Ultimate Killer Collection, by Stuart Dandel, John Duffy and David Mulcahy. The Railway Rapists John Duffy and David Mulcahy were both born in 1959, in a suburb of North London. The two of them had been almost inseparable since they met at Havers Tock Hill Secondary School, based in North London. David Mulcahy would later tell authorities that their friendship was so close, that John Duffy was almost part of his family. Growing up together, it was soon clear who was the more dominant of the pair. Mulcahy was a lot taller than Duffy and he towered over him both physically and mentally. John Duffy would never grow any taller than his given schoolboy height of 5 feet 4 inches, and was often referred to by Mulcahy as, the midget. Both youngsters lived near Hampstead Heath, which was a well-known hook-up area for people of any sexual persuasion. As the two boys grew up they took great enjoyment from spooking the courting couples and homosexuals who gathered there, causing only minor offense, which wouldn't last for long. The pair then developed a love of the martial arts, as did every one of the era. The kung fu craze of the early 70s was huge and Hollywood had glamorized it so well, that it was also popular on British shores. They would practice the moves to subdue relentlessly, increasing their later effectiveness substantially. Around this time they also began to share their true feelings with each other, and in a freakish coincidence, they both derived excitement from physical and sexual cruelty, and crime. It appeared the two young men were made for each other. John Duffy's wife would later testify at the Old Bailey that around this time, Duffy would rape her during bondage sex sessions and also that he would terrorize their German shepherd dog Toby. Apparently it didn't matter where his malice was directed, as long as he could be cruel. In 1976, Mulcahy and Duffy would participate in their first crime together. They were convicted of causing actual bodily harm after they shot four people with an air rifle for fun. The two young men showed little regard for the safety of their victims as they soaked up their personal pleasure. It was shortly after this act that had brought them much enjoyment, that David Mulcahy suggested they should rape a woman together, the ultimate act of power, control, and kinship. Another thing that affected both men equally, was a feeling of sexual inadequacy. John Duffy was afflicted by deep feelings of sexual insufficiency due to his low sperm count. This caused him to have an irrational hatred of women, especially as it had stopped him from fathering children. He felt he couldn't perform his natural duty and women became the figurehead for his blame. Throughout his life David Mulcahy was also afflicted sexually. He was afflicted by problems with maintaining an erection and this would drive him to escalating sexual depravity. Violence and force were the tools with which he aroused himself, without those influences, he was flaccid. According to John Duffy, they planned their first rape as an act of revenge. This was because David Mulcahy despised a particular homeowner in Hendon, North London. The whole twisted plot boiled down to the fact that he wanted to teach the owner a lesson, in reality, it was just another power trip. This first attempt would thankfully turn out to be a failure. The two men broke into the property and waited for their victim but she failed to turn up. The pair then planned another rape at a house in Notting Hill. West London. This also failed to materialize when the woman returned home with a male companion. In 1981, Mulcahy and Duffy were served with suspended sentences from Malton Magistrates Court. They had been found guilty of stealing wines and spirits from a storeroom. Sadly the two men didn't stop with worry from the suspended sentencing. Little over a year later, John Duffy and David Mulcahy would carry out their first rape, in a series of attacks which shocked the people of Great Britain. The pair were well organized, which only increased their effectiveness. They armed themselves with a rape kit which consisted of knives, balaclavas and tape, which they used to bind, gag, and blindfold their victims. While they drove around looking for their victims they would get high on the anticipation of the hunt. 
As an aside, they would often listen and sing along to the Michael Jackson song Thriller, as they did so. The first victim of Duffy and Mulcahy came in October of 1982. She was a 21-year-old woman who was walking home from a party in Kilburn, northwest London. When the men attacked her she was still clutching a teddy bear. The pair used a large piece of sticking plaster to stifle her screams and then dragged her into a garden, where they stripped her bare. Once they had taken control of the situation, the young woman was blindfolded and raped. The two rapists then waited a couple of months before they attacked again. Satiated for a while from their vile actions. In March of 1983, they targeted a new victim. This time they settled on a 29-year-old restaurant manager, who was walking on her own near Finchley Road railway station. As the pair attacked, they were stunned when the woman bit Mulcahy's hand and put up a spirited fight. Despite being kicked and punched repeatedly, the woman's continued actions drove the rapist to let her go. The next attack by Mulcahy and Duffy would not come till almost a year later. Maybe their ego had been battered and bruised from the felled nature of their last assault. On January 20, 1984, an American social worker aged 32, was attacked on Barnes Common. This time the pair, who were in the area decorating Duffy's parents' home, were successful in their attack. The victim was forcefully stripped and then raped. It seems that the two men took some confidence from that attack as they would then take another victim within six months of the last. On the 3rd of June, 1984, they grabbed their fourth victim at West Hampstead Railway Station. The 23-year-old was dragged across the tracks, stripped, and raped. At trial, she managed to give a witness statement. They had a knife and said they would cut me if I didn't do as I was told. All I could say was, please don't hurt me. After the assault, Mulcahy and Duffy passed their victim as they made their getaway. Apparently they left as they saw the distraught woman, joking that they should offer her a lift. Their jovial nature after such a heinous and grave act, is surely testament to their character. As with all power offenders, the thrill began to wear off quicker each time. The attacks would now begin to proliferate. A month later on July the 8th, a woman of 22 was seized on Highgate West Hill. The pair had just gagged their victim with tape when a neighbor called the police. While the police supported her they noticed she still had pieces of tape on her wrists, one of which would later provide crucial evidence against David Mulcahy. Unfortunately, the evidence wouldn't be analyzed correctly until much later. Exactly a week later on July the 15th, Two 18-year-old Danish au pairs were attacked as they walked arm-in-arm arm laughing together across Hampstead Heath. One of them would later state for the court. He told me to take off all my clothes and lie down. Then he pulled his trousers down to his knees and lay on top of me. Both of the girls were raped at knife point. Three months later, Mulcahy and Duffy were arrested after being stopped in Mulcahy's car with stolen building materials. Police also found the black balaclava in the car, but the pair escaped further suspicion after Mulcahy told police he used the mask when he was working as a plasterer. For the theft of the materials, they were punished with a fine. On January 26, 1985, Mulcahy and Duffy were out on a hunt once more. This time they attacked a 20-year-old German au pair who was walking near a canal bridge at Brand Cross. Her scarf was used as a gag and blindfold as she was bundled towards the nearby bridge, where she would be subsequently assaulted. The victim stated to authorities that, the man without the knife sat down and undressed me. He was not rough but he stripped me naked. The woman refused to tell her husband of the ordeal. By the 30th of January, 1985, the despicable duo were back trawling Hampstead Heath again. Their unfortunate victim this time was a 16-year-old virgin, still only a young girl. Duffy would later tell the court that David Mulcahy was becoming increasingly violent, 
so he broke off the attack, fearing that his friend would kill the young victim. A rare glimpse of humanity, though there was still evil in John Duffy. On February the 2nd the two men went out and tried again. This time they grabbed a French au pair who was near Hampstead Heath, but they aborted the attack after she screamed and struggled. John Duffy would claim again that he stopped another attack the following month. This was again because he was worried about Mulcahy's behavior, after the victim was dragged to some flats near the heath. It would appear that by now the dynamics of the attacks were changing, and so possibly was the relationship between the duo. With two unsuccessful attacks behind them, the pair were now desperate for another victim. On March 1, Mulcahy and Duffy selected a 25-year-old solicitor's clerk as she walked across the heath. The two men held the woman at knife point and raped her on a bench. By now though, the sexual pleasure of the hunt and rape was not enough for Mulcahy. He was having increased difficulty with becoming aroused and was beginning to explore more extreme ways to get excited. This would be a major turning point in the severity of the pair's crimes. In witness statements, the victims would state that Mulcahy would run his knife across their lips, whispering threats to gouge out their eyes or slice off their nipples. He reveled in their terror and gained arousal from the power. Several of the rape victims also remembered David Mulcahy blaming them when he could not maintain his erection. This would lead to attacks of increasing sadism. Ultimately, he wanted to yield the power of life over death. On December 29, 1985, just four days after Christmas, the pair of rapists targeted Alice and Day, 19. M's Day was on her way to meet her fiancé at his printing firm in Hackney Wick and she was snatched at the Hackney Wick railway station. From here, she was dragged to snow-covered playing fields nearby, where the two would carry out their most severe assault yet. After both men had raped Allison, she tried to escape and either fell, or was pushed by Mulcahy into the freezing water of a feeder canal, the details at this point become murky. Duffy claims he then pulled her out and that Mulcahy was so excited by the incident, he raped the young woman again. The dominant sadist Mulcahy then tore off a piece of Allison's blouse to throttle her. He did so until her death. David Mulcahy later told Duffy that he had killed Allison because she might recognize them. Duffy had his own opinion of the situation however, he stated later to authorities. David actually enjoyed it, saying it gave him power, the decision over life and death. I remember him going on, it is godlike, having the decision over life and death. The pair then waded down Allison's sheepskin coat with stones and threw her into the water. Her body was discovered 17 days later, still bound and gagged with her hands tied behind her back. John Duffy and David Mulcahy had now progressed from serial rape, to murder. On April 17, 1986, 15-year-old Dutch schoolgirl, Marge Tambozer, was knocked off her bicycle with a link of fishing line stretched across her path. Disorientated and hurt, the teenager was then taken across the fields between Effingham and East Horsley, Surrey. She was then raped by Duffy, who claimed Mulcahy suddenly lost his temper. No doubt due to his sexual inadequacy. Duffy then states that Mulcahy started beating the girl with his fists before swinging an arcing blow that knocked the girl unconscious. It was at this point he noticed a rock in Mulcahy's hand. After this Duffy said Mulcahy ripped off Marge's belt and looped it around her throat, telling him, I do the last one, you'll do this one. He then passed John Duffy the belt, which had a piece of stick through it. In court Duffy stated to jurors. I actually started twisting it while David turned away. I think I just got caught up in it. It is very difficult to explain. I just continued twisting until she was dead. The pair left the scene, but Mulcahy would later return and set Marge's body alight, stuffing burning tissues into her vagina in the hope of destroying forensic evidence. On the 18th of May, 1986, 
Newlywed TV secretary Ann Locke, 29, was ambushed getting off a train at Brookmans Park, Hertfordshire. The pair had selected their victim after spotting her bicycle in the station's shed, they then just waited in the bushes and hid until she returned. Duffy said he raped Anne first, then Mulcahy threw him the keys and he went to collect the car. After this, Mulcahy was apparently buzzing, and said they should keep their eyes open for another victim. Anne Locke's decomposed body was found two months after she was murdered, she had been suffocated with her own sock. By now, police were well into their investigation and the name of John Duffy was touted as a suspect among thousands of other names, mainly due to the fact that he was a known sex offender. He had previously been convicted of the rape of his wife. As well as working together with Mulcahy, John Duffy had now also started to rape alone. This would turn out to be his downfall however, as he was arrested while following a woman in a secluded park. Whilst in custody, Duffy was questioned about the spate of rapes and murders and the next day he was charged on all counts. When detectives searched his parents' house, they found rope that linked him to the second murder victim. Police knew that he had not committed the offenses alone, but Duffy was not forthcoming about his accomplice. David Mulcahy was also questioned due to his close friendship with Duffy, but their victims were still severely traumatized and unable to pick him out of an identity parade. Degenerate sexual sadist Mulcahy, was released due to lack of evidence. John Duffy went on trial in February of 1988, and was convicted of two counts of murder and four counts of rape. The court acquitted him of raping and killing Anne Locke however. He was sentenced to a minimum tariff of 30 years by the judge, which was later extended to a whole life tariff by the Home Secretary. As Britain was part of the European Union. The European Court of Human Rights later removed the right of politicians to reset sentence tariffs, and so John Duffy's sentence was reverted to the original 30 years. Following his conviction, John Duffy confirmed to a forensic psychologist that he had not attacked the women alone. However, he chose to reveal no more about the attacks. That was until 1997 rolled around and he implicated lifelong friend. David Mulcahy. John Duffy also admitted his involvement in the attack on Anne Locke, although he could not be tried for this crime under the double jeopardy rule. Following Duffy's claims, David Mulcahy was dragged for several months by police prior to his arrest, in doing so they gained crucial forensic evidence against him. Officers now had access to DNA tests which conclusively proved his involvement. He was arrested on 3 February, 1999. In the year 2000, John Duffy appeared at the Old Bailey as a witness against his old friend David Mulcahy, and gave detailed evidence to the court over a period of 14 days. It was the first time in British legal history that a highest category prisoner had given evidence against an accomplice. Prosecution evidence at the trial presented David Mulcahy as the chief instigator and the dominant force that led them first to turn to murder. On February 1, 2001, David Mulcahy was convicted of three counts of murder and seven counts of rape. For these crimes he was handed down three life sentences, with a 30-year recommendation. He was not later given a whole life sentence as the ruling, barring politically set tariffs had been made by the time his case was up for review. John Duffy was convicted of a further 17 rapes and received 12 years to his sentence. Neither man is expected to ever be released from prison. Detectives suspect the despicable duo of countless other sex attacks during the 1970s, with David Mulcahy also being suspected of attacks which took place after John Duffy was jailed.